Hey, everybody. We're just going to give some people a little time to flood in before we start. But, uh, you know, I'm your host, Jake from Kinetic. We also have Christine from, uh, from Kinetic, one of our core team members. We were going to have another uh, dear friend, Lindsay, uh, but she is quite sick, which is unfortunate. So it'll just be the two best looking uh, people at Kinetic. So you're in for a treat. So let's let's give people a few more minutes to come in and uh, we'll start. All right, I think we have a good enough group. So let's see, this is the Kinetic Core AMA and giveaway. This is the first one we're doing. Uh, I'd like to do more. I'd like to get to the habit of uh, doing regular kind of check-ins with the community. Uh, we had a lot of response to our initial uh, form that was asking for questions and a lot of really good questions. We're also probably going to touch on some questions that I've just seen around in the community um, and uh, kind of just go through uh, generally uh, what we've been seeing that people are concerned about, interested in, etc. cetera. Uh, regarding the giveaway section, brow, 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 uh, <laughs> We are giving uh, away 25,000 flare uh, split between 10 lucky people. How do we select these people? We would like you to, if you look at the, uh, the Jumbotron up there, uh, just retweet, like, and comment on this Twitter space. And basically, we're going to just get all those names, uh, throw it through Twitter Picker, get 10 people, uh, and then I will reach out to them, make sure that the Kinetic account that is reaching out to you is us. Uh, you know, you, you don't have to be on Twitter long to uh, to see uh, people impersonating other people. So make sure it's us um, before you uh, get any, uh, don't give anyone your private keys, okay? Okay. So, yeah, uh, let's start, I guess, before uh, we get into the specific questions that people submitted with a little introduction. So you guys know me uh, if you've looked at any kind of Kinetic stuff. Uh, I'm, I'm Jake. I'm the kind of communications person behind Kinetic. I do the Connecting with Kinetic YouTube videos. Uh, you know, I, I kind of handle social media. Anything that is about kinetic and ends up on a screen, I usually have input in. Um, but I would love to introduce, kind of for the uh, the first time, it, at least a voice. It, we'll see if uh, we can uh, see her wonderful face soon. But Christine, could you tell us a little bit about your background and uh, what you do for kinetic? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Jake. Um, so I am Christine. I am also the wonderful non-face behind Ask Me on our Telegram. I have been working with RBL um, in lots of different capacities for the past different years. I've had uh, the pleasure of working with them in different ecosystems, um, in different lending markets. And really, when it comes down to it, I work in our business strategy development. Um, basically, I like to call myself the glue. So I help bring all the partners together, help look for new partnerships that can be made, make sure everything is running the way it's supposed to, and that everybody has what they need to do their job successfully. Um, it's a lot of fun. I get to meet a lot of different people in a lot of different ecosystems and help them find their fit with us um, and for you guys. So that being said, I the thing I love about lending is that in each different ecosystem, there's it's completely different. The, the communities are different. The ecosystems are different. And so it, it's really a new experience. Every time um, I have the opportunity to participate at this level, it, it's a whole new world, a whole new job. And there's so much learning involved. And I, I'm really grateful to be a part of the community here with you guys. Awesome. So uh, I think we can just get right into it. We had a lot of questions submitted. Uh, the first one... <laughs> which yeah, I picked first because it's, it's, you know, truly my favorite question. I've gotten it more than once is will kinetic have monthly airdrops? Okay. So because, um, our other, <laughs> 
our other uh, core team member isn't here today, I guess I'm going to be the one answering all these questions. So you guys are going to have to really get to know my voice here. Um, so no, Kinetic itself doesn't have monthly airdrops, but we do have the key stake program. And so what that is, is if you take our jewel token and you stake it, we have 45 day voting cycles that, that are things that matter. It's off chain, but it gives all of our community the opportunity to participate in the direction that we're going um, with the protocol. This is like new integrations, new partnerships, what you guys want to see. And so every 45 days, we're going to put out a vote. And if you vote, we are going to pay you for the work that you are doing, for giving us your input, because with that input, we can make better, more well-rounded decisions as a community towards where we want to go. So even though it's not an airdrop, um, there is a consistent 45-day opportunity to earn more. Exactly. And and that's, that's something that uh, we hope will be a big differentiator for us is, uh, you know, not only do we want to, we want to be a community lending protocol. We want to interface with the community, and that's one way of doing it. Um, but we also want to give you guys a lot more input than is than is normal. Um, we want to make sure that you have a voice and that we're listening to it. Uh, another question is, will Kinetic have its own app or will we be able to use Bifrost Wallet? I'm assuming the person who made this question uh, is saying, will it have its own phone app? Uh, Kinetic is going to be a dApp. You can use it through Bifrost. You can use it through MetaMask. Uh, you can use it through Solidify uh, and other wallets, I believe. So don't worry about that, buddy. You'll be able to use that Bifrost and get on Kinetic, no problem. I'm just going to jump in here. I want to add that um, in a kind of longer term vision, even though right now it is its own dApp and you have to go uh, to kinetic.market to participate. I am in contact with a lot of um, cool people who are in the wallet business. And we do know of current ways. Um, we we aren't solidified with one wallet partner yet, but for the future, for to be able to interact with your wallets and say you have whatever on Ethereum, you'll be able to one-click deploy into our market. So just a little vision for the future. This is definitely something that we're looking into um, because we know that as this space evolves, it's really cool. You used to have to be kind of a, a super tech person to be involved, and we're making it easier and easier, and Kinetic is definitely focused on that path. Um, so just for the future, something to watch out for. Absolutely. Um, and there's going to be lots of new and exciting stuff that we roll out, um, which kind of ties into our next question. What makes Kinetic unique? compared to other lending protocols. I talked a bit about our governance structure, and you can, of course, read more about uh, the nitty gritty about Kinetic in our light paper. But honestly, the big thing that makes us unique is that we are on Flare. We are kind of a, uh, I don't want to say one-stop shop, but we're a crystallization of uh, a proof of concept of what Flare has been trying to do with all their various technologies that they've been rolling out. Uh, you know, we, obviously we leverage FTSO, but F assets are going to be huge for us. Uh, the ability to open up these new markets that uh, haven't had really as, as much exposure as they could uh, and really expand Flare DeFi, something that's going to be really exciting. And of course, we are going to take full advantage of Layer Cake. Um, so, you know, the benefits to Flare end up being the benefits to us. And I think that puts us in a very unique strategic position uh, as a lending protocol. Yeah. And I just, again, to add in, that is the reason why we chose to be here, you know, to pop up a, another lending market. Like they're, they're in every ecosystem, they're all over the place. But when it really comes down to it, the, the ability to create these lending markets for assets, I mean, you can lend wrapped Bitcoin in other places, but the difference is that it's the F assets, that it is the layer cake version, that that's what we are working towards, um, to be able to participate in a more secure and decentralized way um, as these technologies advance, that that is how we got behind this in the first place is because we saw this opportunity and we are about making a you know, safer, more decentralized, more, more advanced protocol for you guys. Um, and we are able to do that. So we're just excited about it. That and Hugo totally sweet talked us, took us out to a nice <laughs> dinner, <laughs> lit candles. 
That that's the only way to get Jake and I, anyways. <laughs> yeah, you know, I need a steak. Give me a give me a steak, some soft music. Um, the, the next question we have uh, is it's a bit of a bigger one, but it is something that uh, I mean we've seen since day one. People talking about we've tried to answer it in various places, but uh, something about Twitter is <laughs> if you answer something in a comment. A lot of times people are never going to see it. Uh, it it's it's kind of hard to make sure everyone sees our responses to things. So the next question is, why did you choose to skip launching on Songbird and go straight to Flare? Uh, Christine, do you want to address this? Yeah, I guess I'm going to have to. It's the elephant in the room. Um, we understood when we decided that we were going to build on Flare that there was Songbird, this canary network. And we understand the value in canary networks um, I want people to know that it's not that we as a protocol decided to push that aside. We do believe in rigorous testing. We do believe in security. Um, and it's it's one of our main factors. Like, it's the thing we focus on most. I mean, anybody can fork a lending protocol. Um, but when it comes down to it, the differentiating factors are what do you have in place security-wise. And so when we talked about, um, you know, we are using Constant 2. We are going to have a testnet rollout. Everyone will be able to participate. And the comments that I've been seeing are more along the lines of cool, like I can go on to this test net and button mash, but that doesn't actually give me, you know, the same. It It's not incentivized in the same way that Songbird is for people to come and try and take advantage of it. So I hear what you're saying. Um, I am listening. But what I need to explain is kind of how lending markets work. If I were to launch a lending market on Songbird, it would not be the same kinetic that we are launching on Flare. Um, it would have the same underlying infrastructure, but the thing that makes a lending market unique and the thing that makes it um, really different is the assets available within each specific ecosystem. So when we're talking about lending, I'm saying, you know, people are going to put their money into supply and then somebody else is going to borrow against it. In order to keep the protocol secure, what needs to happen is there needs to be enough on-chain liquidity to liquidate in um, an event that somebody needs to get liquidated. So if I create this lending market on Songbird, I am testing against the parameters, testing against the assets, the availability, what's in the mempool over there, because that is how we do it. We have our security teams um, kind of analyze out into the future and read these things before they happen. So even though I can say, okay, nothing happened on Songbird, that doesn't translate to nothing happened on Flare. Um, the infrastructure itself, because we work with from Blockchain Labs, has been deployed on Avalanche, has been deployed on Moonwell and on Base and in Kava and in multiple other places. And so we know from an infrastructure standpoint um, that we have a battle-tested product that's not to say that things can't go wrong. I mean, nobody can ever, you know, 100% guarantee, but we have a product that has been put to the test in multiple different ecosystems, and we're pretty confident in how that stands. What we have to take into account is in each different ecosystem, the vulnerabilities that exist with those assets, with that access. And that is where this hardcore security comes in. Um, right now, we're working with Lworks. Uh, we have our auditing team and our internal auditor who is on, we have an internal auditor who works with us with every single thing that we do. Um, so even though they're not public audits that get pushed out, any change we make ever goes through them. And there's a huge price to pay for that security. I am not saying that we are not willing to pay for the security and that's why we're not launching on Songbird. I am saying that those things would equate to a completely separate lending protocol. So in our specific case, it doesn't make sense. If somebody wanted to have a lending protocol on Songbird, 100% we would be for it. Um, but just because we're not on Songbird doesn't mean that we're skipping a step per se in our, in our case, just because what you're looking for, we wouldn't be able to give you an answer yes or no to by having launched there. So I know that this is a really long-winded answer, but I'm trying to help people understand um, from our perspective, why we didn't go there. Um, just because the things that happened previously, and we'll address this later with different um, lending protocols on it, on Songbird, it doesn't mean 
won't happen on Flare, even though they they change those things on Songbird. So if you're kind of picking up what I'm putting down, Jake, I don't know if I ramble too much, but you can try and bring it home for me. Yeah, no, it, it makes perfect sense. Uh, I, I guess in a shortened way, uh, the, a lot of the reason people test on Songbird is to use real assets in a testing environment to learn. Uh, in regards to our infrastructure, we've learned with real assets, uh, and those changes have already been incorporated into the version uh, of the protocol that we're using for Kinetic. Uh, in another way that it's it's not exactly uh, super feasible, essentially we would be not only like doubling our cost with hiring vendors because it is another network, uh, you know, so that's that's an immediate double uh, there. It's also that we're going to be less efficient. We're going to be fragmenting liquidity. Uh, we would not be able to operate as well on both networks as we can uh, just on Flare. So th there's lots of reasons, but yeah, and those are the, kind of the main ones. I want to reiterate, too, that it's not just that we wouldn't be able to operate as well. We would be operating two different lending markets um, from a technical standpoint. We would be operating two completely separate lending markets because they're not the same assets, because it's not the same ecosystem, it would be the equivalent of having two lending markets. So just I'm just going to bring that back and make sure that people understand that. It wouldn't be, you know, Kinetic on Flare and Kinetic on Songbird um, when it really came down to it because of the differentiation in assets and availability and bridges and every sort of exploit you can have is different. So I just want to really drive home that point. Right. No, I, I think I think uh, you know I think people are are picking it up. Um, the next question, a, a much simpler question than, than the previous one, won't have to unpack too much. Uh, who is handling the market making service for Kinetic? I believe this was asked before we made our announcement uh, that we are working with Skynet and they will be handling our market making service. Great people, uh, wonderful team, lots of experience. Uh, you know, feel free to learn more about them, but, uh, you know, we're very happy to be uh, working with them. Yeah, um, just to add on to that, Skynet, I mean, is a pretty reputable, well-known, they've been around for quite a while, and it really comes down to trust um, with your market makers. It is something that you need when launching on a centralized exchange. It's required by pretty much every centralized exchange, so when it comes down to it, we had to pick somebody who had a great reputation, um, and so we chose them. Feel free to look more into them. They're great partners to have. And we made it through without making any Terminator jokes. Uh, next question. When will the Jewel token launch on the ProBit Global Centralized Exchange? Well, the token that even <laughs> it's kind of a funny story. I, I we're excited to announce that we don't have a date yet. We um actually are in the process right now of our public audit. Super, super exciting. That should be done within the next couple of weeks. And then shortly after that, we can start rolling out information about when that's going to happen. Um, to put this in kind of a timeline perspective, what happens is we need to have a public audit and then we are going to launch a token and then we are going to launch a testnet and then Genesis pools and then we are going to launch. And if you notice throughout our documentation and what we're putting out there publicly, um, a lot of these things happen to say Q2 on them, so I would keep your eyes peeled. Yeah, it's, it's you know, we're doing a lot of stuff. We're doing a lot of new stuff. Uh, things are changing all the time, and uh, we got to make sure that we're doing it right. So we got to make sure that the audits are, are going through and everything's good. Um, okay. Which, uh, this next question, which asset will be required to purchase Jewel on Probit? Um, so initially it will be launched with USDT as its paired asset. Uh, there would have been a lot of benefit to us <laughs> and the Flare ecosystem if we had launched it against Flare. Um, how it kind of works is we have massive expectations. Uh, this is speculation. It is not financial advice. Do your own research, my friends. Uh, but we expect the price of Flare to be going up. Um, so if we had launched our token against Flare, it could have been really easy for us to ride the wave with you guys and be part of that growth. 
Um, but what we decided to do is go with USDT. It is more friendly for new people into the environment. It makes it super easy from anyone from anywhere to be able to participate and get into um, the Flare ecosystem. Um, so it's kind of like a stepping stone, which is what we were trying to inspire with that one. So pretty excited. Right. So, you know, what you're going to be seeing as a through line through the stuff that we do and the decisions we make is we really want to attract new people. We want to bring new people to the Flare ecosystem. Uh, that's how we see long term success, not for just us, but for Flare. Um, cool. Uh, next question. When will the Jewel token be on a Gnosis? I know this has been highly requested to have an answer. <laughs> this is kind of a funny question. Um, so we uh, we are originally, we're going to start with our launch on Probit. And then from there, I'm sure it'll make its way to DEXs. I cannot give an exact date. Um, I'm sure all of you know how a DEX works. Anybody can add liquidity. You need to watch the different pools, see what's got volume, see what's going on. Technically, we are not allowed to um, see the decks, so we will see what happens and make sure that we're working with partners to make sure that runs smoothly. Um, so I don't have an exact date for you, but I am 100% sure that that will be happening. Extremely exciting. Basically, it'll be on there. Don't worry. It'll happen. Uh <laughs> The next question that was submitted is when will, and we touched on this a bit, when will Kinetics testnet go live? Yeah, I just gave you the low key outline of what our plans are. Um, like I said, we're in public audit right now, and then we will talk about testnet and token launch. I, For token launch, it's a little more vague. I can't give you like specific dates now, but I can tell you the goal aim date. This is not the date, but... What we are aiming for is about mid, um, mid-April. So that's really exciting because that's really not that far away. It means I need to get back to work pretty soon. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of uh, hurry up, wait, and then hurry up uh, in, in the Web3 space. But, yeah, uh, you know. it's, running, it's running full speed into a brick wall and then shaking it off and then keep running. <laughs> yeah. Um, next question is... How will Genesis pools work and when are they coming? So this is super exciting. Um, a lot of these when are they coming things. Again, I told you we are going to do token launch and then um, testnet and then Genesis pools. So that is the order in which they come out to reiterate. How do they work? Well, what a Genesis pool is, it's a way for us to incentivize uh, early adopters in the protocol. So before the protocol goes live, you can enter the supply market. Um, so there will be no availability to borrow against these assets. What it really is is a show of community and user support that, you know, we know this is coming. And for taking that effort, we incentivize the heck out of it. Um, so it's a really exciting time. Usually it lasts about two to three weeks. And it's a time to just pile on. What happens is you will deposit your whatever token is available to deposit into these Genesis pools, the ones that we have listed, um, into the supply. And then you take the K token, which is, I'm going to say this right now, if you know about other lending protocols, they're known as C tokens. Um, that came from Compound. We are Kinetic, so we are calling them K tokens. You're going to take that K token and enter it into a different smart contract, which is the Genesis Pools contract. And that is the one that's going to distribute the rewards for this time. Um, as long as you stay in that contract, you will continue to earn rewards, but you are not locked into this contract. If you decide, you know what, Genesis Pools aren't for me, I don't like these extra incentives, you can pull that token out at any time. And then you will have to go back and pull your token out of supply. Or you could just stay in supply and not earn anything but be part of the process. Um, that's up to you. And then when that ends, um, it's really important that users take their, and we'll have a thousand announcements about it. It'll be very clear. But when the timeline ends for earning in those Genesis pools, you can simply remove your C token and you are part of the regular supply we will go live and then you will be able to earn the interest of the normal borrow yield or borrow, um, lend borrow reward um, that, that comes with the protocol. So it makes it super simple. And I, I know we haven't released it yet, but our UX is <laughs> very intuitive. It's going to lead you all the way through this process. 
Um, we are trying to make it as user friendly as possible and they're doing an excellent job. So I am super excited to be able to show you guys uh, pretty soon um, what that all looks like. Awesome. Uh, next up is a fairly uh, basic question, but there's a lot of people who are completely new to Linux protocols. So uh, a good one to ask nonetheless. Uh, the question is, loans through Kinetic are over collateralized. What does that mean? All right, so still excited to be here answering questions for you. <laughs> I, <laughs> I talk all day long, but it's completely different. <laughs> so over collateralization means that when you put, um, first of all, you cannot just come to Kinetic and take out a loan without having put in any collateral. That means that we have no way of going back and saying, hey, you owe us money. Um, not us, but the people who supplied that money. So what needs to happen is you need to go to Kinetic Talk Markets, you supply an asset. Now, depending on that asset, there will be different factors that will tell you how much you can borrow. It will also indicate what your health um, factor looks like. That's a whole different conversation, but we want to keep you in a good range so that you're not going to be liquidated. It'll give you all those parameters. So you supply your assets, you toggle a little button that says use it as collateral, and then you can borrow against it it is always going to be less than the amount that you put in. Why? We need to keep our suppliers safe. So there are people that are going to choose to supply Flare and borrow USDT. Well, we need to, those aren't the same assets. So, and it's not always the same people borrowing the same thing. So we need to be able to keep everybody safe in the event of price fluctuations in, in all of these things. It's going to be less in order to keep our users in a good place. We understand that there are more high risk protocols out there that allow for under collateralization, um, but being the foundational primitive on Flare for lending, it is extremely important to us that our goal, number one, is to pro provide you with an opportunity, but that number one goal is not at the expense of risk. Um, and so everything within our protocol might seem a little bit unsexy, but that is who we are. That is what we are about. We are trying to provide the highest quality um, protocol infrastructure uh, without compromising risk and security. So yeah, everything is over collateralized if you are doing lending um, and borrowing with Flare on Kinetic. So the next question, and we talked about this uh, a bit, but uh, what security measures does Kinetic have in place? Uh, big thing being our real-time risk assessment with LedgerWorks, which we've, we've talked about and made a fun little infographic of. Um, but we also have auditing done by WatchPug and our internal auditor. Uh, and this probably would be a good time to uh, address some of the stuff that, I, I mean, I've seen people talking about, people bring it up to us fairly often, but, um, you know, there was a, a situation on Songbird with, you know, uh, you know, Enosis, uh, I think it was Flare Finance at that time, uh, doing loans that didn't pan out so well. So it, it, in a simple way, people would like to know, like, you know, why uh, are we better or, or why are we not going to have the same issues as them? While I super appreciate your question, I am not going to phrase it in that way. I, I would, because I wasn't there at the time, because I need to learn from, you know, what's happened in the past, but also wasn't directly there to experience the problem. I don't want to directly compare myself against um, what happened uh, on Songbird, but like, I, I can't make actual accusations. They didn't do this and we do this because I don't know. Um, going through their documentation, trying to figure it out. I don't know. I'm sure some of you know who their risk partners were. Um, I, I'm not sure. But all I can tell you is that we have 24-hour security monitoring from Rome Blockchain Labs. That's part of our agreement with our, you know, integration with them. And also 24-hour monitoring with LedgerWorks. So these things, these projections into the future to see these black swan events and the potential things, the simulations that they run, I mean, it's it's amazing. We're going to have some dashboards live eventually. Um, we have ones that work for us. We were talking to them about trying to get some made for you guys. Um, so you can kind of see what's going on, where the risks are. But this is what makes the difference. It's not about what's happening on the protocol now. It's about what the potential is in the future. And that that's what makes the difference. That's why 
you know, we can say we we're putting out a product that we can stand behind um, is really our partnerships in security. And also this isn't really announced yet, but we are really good friends with Into the Block. They have a huge presence here. Um, we have, although we haven't technically engaged with them yet, that is a huge, huge thing that we're excited to be putting forward. Um, once we go live is their, uh, their dashboard. And it's just another way for users to be able to look into the future and kind of see what's going on now, what's going on, what's happened in the past with liquidations. They have an amazing, amazing dashboard. Um, that is very it's institutional grade, which is great. Um, it promotes a lot of big users that come into the space, but it is also user friendly enough for the average person to go and say, hey, I can kind of understand what's going on. So we use a combination of all of these things to stay on top of it. And that is why without having to directly compare myself to what I'm putting out versus what anybody else put out, we can stand behind what we do. Right. I mean, at the end of the day, security is all about information uh, and being in the know. And, you know, we, you know, pay a lot of money, work really hard, uh, make great partners to ensure that we're ahead of the curve. And when something is going to go wrong or could go wrong, we know ahead of time. Uh, and we're really excited to be able to bring that uh, same amount of information through these dashboards uh, to the community as well. Uh, next up is a bit of a, a more technical question, but valid nonetheless. Uh, how does the jump rate model integrate into Kinetic's algorithmic lending and borrowing platform to manage liquidity and borrowing costs effectively? Yeah, I don't know who wrote this question, but perhaps to you, I, it looks like you looked into something. And it's great because these are the kind of questions that people, you know, that they don't look necessarily when they're using the lending markets, what kind of parameters are set. Um, there's quite a few parameters that are used for each specific market. So it won't be the same for all of the available assets that we have. I'm just putting that out there now. There's not a standardization. This is another one of those things that if we had launched on Songbird, it wouldn't be the same there that it is here um, because it's all based on availability and per asset. So the jump rate model is a dynamic mechanism um, that adjusts the interest rates based on protocol utilization. So what does that mean? We have this lovely algorithmic mechanism that, you know, depending on the borrow versus the supply, it's going to adjust the interest rates um, to keep the protocol in kind of this happy place so that there's, you know, if there's too much lending and not enough borrowing, well, then people are going to be incentivized less to lend and people are going to be incentivized more to borrow to keep it in a happy place. Um, once you hit a certain uh, utilization rate, which is sometimes like 80, 85%, that jump rate model, what it does is spike up um, the interest for being able to borrow. So where it would normally be this nice balance between the two, it's going to go really high, really fast. So keeping an eye at, um, Generally, this isn't a problem. I mean, you're going to pay more interest, but the idea is that people take notice and get back to the place where they're supposed to be um, in, in that balance. And generally, I mean, you can see this in your health factor. You can pay attention by looking at the interest rates. This is not a no-risk situation um, because everything is fluctuating all the time. We try and keep it at this great balance. We try and make it really user-friendly and try and keep people in the know of how to read these things. Um, but I will be putting out some documentation on this jump rate model. There's a really cool little graph that makes it super easy on the eyes. And you can say, hey, okay, so once it gets to this point, then people are going to be, you know, paying a lot more to take those loans. And the whole goal is to keep, you know, the protocol in a, in a good place. So that's what that means. Yeah, the person who wrote that question definitely read our light paper, which kudos to you, uh, if anyone else is interested in reading. I know it's hard, folks, but if anyone else is interested in reading, uh, you know, the currently pinned most recent tweet in the Jumbotron is a link to our light paper, which we're very proud of. We love it. We'd love for those eyes of yours to glance upon its glory. Uh, the next question is one that uh, we've gotten from a few different places. Uh, it's something we've been thinking about a lot, and it's something that uh, we have a solution for. So the question is, is it possible um, 
to also earn FTSO delegation and flare drop rewards while lending flare. So, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're no strangers to how the flare network works. We're no strangers to how much people love them flare drops. Uh, so naturally it's, Hey, wait a minute. If I can't claim my flare drop, if I'm lending the flare and I don't get that, if someone else gets that, well, that's no fun. Uh, it's it's definitely a real problem. And, uh, you know, we have worked really hard to find a way to address that. Jake, I, I need you to help me out here. I, for all of those of you who don't know, Jake and I work super, super closely together. And we're both big, big goofballs um, when it comes down to it. So I need him to help me out with a wicked air horn sound so I can make this next comment. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so that is my intro to the super alpha of this call. We have been working super hard. Um, we've actually worked with the Gnosis who had the whole situation worked out where they they have a solution for this flare drops thing where if you you know deposit into their into their pools on the decks, then you can still claim your flare drops and your FTSO rewards. Well, the thing about that is it works great on a decks, but the problem with a lending market is if you deposit your flare into our lending market and then somebody borrows it, you no longer have that. So we did integrate this system that they have that says, okay, so if you do that, um, the remainder of what's left in the pool, because I told you before, there's going to be, you know, these factors, part of that is the what you can borrow. So there's always going to be some left in the pool. We could divvy that out to the people that remained, but it is impossible for us to incentivize at the same rate um, that flare drops would for those people. So we had to keep looking for a solution. This has been a huge part of um, the last couple months for us in building. And now for the alpha, we have partnered with um, Scepter. This is a new partnership. It is not announced yet, but what Scepter does is liquid staking. So what we're bringing to the table here is liquid staking on flare. That way you can go to Scepter uh, you can switch your asset for the liquid stake version and then deposit it into the protocol and you are still the owner of that asset. The rewards will be distributed 100% to you and you can still participate in lending by depositing into the protocol and using it as collateral. This is a huge win for us. This is a huge win for you and for the ecosystem as a whole because as DeFi evolves on Flare, there's going to be an untangling that happens in two years from now when, you know, when the flare drops end and we no longer need to use this wrapped version of the asset anymore, there will be an unwinding. And every protocol that has used, you know, these solutions and made their protocols work with the wrapped version will kind of have to backtrack and say, okay, well, where do we go from here? Well, we no longer are going to have to do that. We can just liquid stake them and then we are good to go. Um, so we are super, super, super excited about that. If you are thinking, who is Scepter? I've never heard of them. Um, like I said, we work with Jerome Blockchain Labs. They developed this liquid staking platform on Banky for Avalanche. So again, it is another battle-tested, well-known um, product. We are super, super excited. I can't believe we didn't have him on here and he allowed us to just show this. Super excited for everybody who's here in the space to be able to get to know this alpha. Um, <laughs> but really, it, it's, it is going to be a huge opportunity uh, for the Flare ecosystem. So we're so excited. Liquid staking. Be excited. Let me see some clapping emojis. I'm going to I'm gonna back up and say liquid delegating for all of you technical friends out there. It is the exact same product as on Avalanche. Like I said, we all refer to it as liquid staking. Technically, liquid delegating for anybody out there who is a big fan of terms. For the people who love to nitpick terms, liquid delegation, in parentheses, it's it's liquid staking. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, that uh, we had another question that basically was uh, around the same thing. Uh, you know, will people be able to simultaneously stake, delegate, and participate with Kinetics products? The answer is yes, you can. It's super exciting, and uh, we'll have more. Uh, you know, actual information, nice, nice, beautiful blog post about this uh, announcement. But, you know, just wanted to have something fun to kind of end our AMA uh, to, you know, let everybody on Flare know that it's going to be okay.
there's going to be reasons to lend. Uh, you'll still get your flare it. drops. <laughs> we're really, oh. at the end of the day, we're all uh, going to make it. Uh, so thank you to everyone for tuning in. Um, I know there's lots of questions in the comments. Uh, we will do another one of these. Uh, so, you know, uh, I, I'll do the same thing where we'll have a form for people to submit stuff. Um, you know, please, if, if your question wasn't answered this time, uh, you know, when that form goes out, please feel free to submit your question there and we will uh, address it. We were able to answer every question that was submitted, uh, which is exciting. Um, Regarding the giveaway, yeah. So if you are interested in being considered for the giveaway, uh, what you have to do, the giveaway of 25,000 flair being split among 10 lucky listeners, uh, you know, tune in. You know, if you're here listening to this, you, you did that. Uh, so good job. Uh, <laughs> retweet the Twitter space. Um, so that's that's going to be uh, the uh, the first pinned thing in the Jumbotron is, is our Twitter space. Uh, retweet that, like it, make sure you're following us uh, so we can talk to you later and uh, leave a comment. Uh, comment can be anything. It can even be, um, you know, if you were to go on a date with Hugo, what would you maybe eat? Uh, I'd be interested to know. Jake Are you a steak steak. person? Jake says steak. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, uh, again, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope uh, you learned a little something. I hope you're excited for liquid staking coming to Flare. Uh, and uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you, everybody. Uh, next time we'll have Lindsay with us. Um, just to backtrack all the way to the beginning of the episode, Lindsay is our security and integrations partner. So she's no fun anyway, but we will invite her next time. And we hope to see you there. Yeah. We love you guys. Thanks for tuning in.